Hey, welcome to the OT for Life podcast. Today, I am so, so, so excited to share with you a chat that I had with Laura Pettix from the OT Butterfly. We talk about all things sensory and working in a sensory clinic and also dive deep into bridging the gap between providing therapy within the clinic environment and how best to facilitate carryover for our clients within the home, school, and in the community. If you're curious to know what occupational therapy has to do with butterflies, then make sure that you stay till the very end of the episode. For links to the resources mentioned in this episode, as well as any of my other episodes, check out otforlife.com slash resources. That's O-T, the number four, L-Y-F-E dot com slash resources. If you're interested in occupational therapy, this is the place for you. This show aims to explore our profession by sharing who we are and what we do. Because for us, occupational therapy is more than just a job. Hi, I'm Sarah. Welcome to OT for Life. Hi, Laura. Welcome to the show. Hey, Sarah. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing really well today. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. Hanging out. Awesome. Well, I was just wondering, because it's a lovely Saturday morning right now, what has been your favorite occupation that you've done so far today? Definitely eat waffles. (laughs) Weekends are my probably the only time of the week where I actually sit down and eat breakfast. And that's because my husband's home. So I have an extra pair of hands to help me with my little one, my toddler, who is two years old now. And during the work week, I take care of her in the morning before I go to work. So feeding her breakfast takes kind of a little bit extra effort. And I don't like to eat and like stand around. I usually like to sit down and eat. So I end up eating at work sometimes really late or skipping breakfast. So I definitely look forward to my Saturday morning waffles when my husband makes them for me. (laughs) I totally agree with that because I feel like during the week it's always just busy rushing around trying to get out the door like trying to make sure everybody else is organized and I'm I'm the same way like I love sitting down and having a nice relaxing breakfast Mm -hmm. like even if it's just a bowl of cereal but like sitting and like enjoying a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something like that where you're just like I don't have to rush out the door right now (laughs) exactly before I had my daughter I feel like eating was one of my favorite occupations. Like I was definitely a foodie. I enjoyed trying new meals, making new foods. And, you know, when she was a newborn up until now, I still, there's still some times where eating is just a means to an end, just to have calories, just to fuel myself. And it sometimes when I think about it, it makes me sad because I miss the times when I could like sit down and really like mindfully enjoy my meals. And it's not as often as I would like these days. I get it. And I don't even have kids. And I get it. Because sometimes (laughs) it's just like, I'm so busy, I need to just eat so I can continue doing whatever it is that I need to get done that day. And I don't know what your schedule is like, but I make my own schedule. But when I make it, I like to consolidate my day. So I sometimes don't even leave myself a lunch break. So I'm like eating bars or drinking smoothies. I'm just always on the go throughout my day. I don't get that natural like lunch break often. And sometimes I start my day so late with my clients that Like I'll start at like 1130. So I'll try to just eat a late breakfast and then eat a banana and a bar in between clients as I'm handing them off through a day. So most of my meals, I would say, are not really spent sitting down at a table, like thinking about what I'm eating. I don't even know what a lunch break is. Like, but <laughs> okay, I, good. yeah, because I've done the same thing with my schedule where I'd rather just block everything together. Yeah. And either start later or end earlier and have more yep. time rather than have a lunch break in the middle of the day. And so it's same thing. Like I basically I find myself eating almost in between every client or like every other client yeah. where I'll have just a small snack and mm-hmm. then move on. And my lunch breaks are really sitting in my car. Yeah. Sometimes I get to be parked <laughs> while yeah. I sit and have my lunch break. Oh my gosh. And sometimes I'm driving because I have 10 minutes to get to the next client and I'm starving and I yep. am eating as I'm driving. And it's just, that's, yep, that <laughs> that's the life of a pediatric OT. <laughs> so you must eat a lot of like cold foods, like things you can't warm up or just things that are easy to eat with like one hand, like sandwiches? Actually, no. 
Interestingly enough, I have, okay, so I'm like a huge proponent of hydro flasks. They're like the thermo insulated, uh, like they have water bottles and they also have food containers. And I got one, I want to say maybe a year and a half ago, maybe almost two years ago. And that was a life changer for me because I can heat up whatever it is that I need in the morning and then it will stay hot like throughout the day. So whenever I eat it, it's still warm and it's amazing. The one thing is, is it still has to be somewhat easy to eat eat so like Mm -hmm. (laughs) so much detail here but like if it's spaghetti I have to like cut it up into like (laughs) bite-sized pieces and I have to eat it with (laughs) this is so (laughs) this this is just me I have to eat it with a spoon because if it's a fork I can't risk it like falling into my lap and like falling on my shirt or anything like that so I literally eat my lunches with this like huge spoon (laughs) and I have these like tiny little bite-sized things oh my goodness yep (laughs) but I actually I don't I can't even remember the last time I had a sandwich like that's just not oh my god that's something that I do yeah (laughs) I would use as as an excuse to eat a burger like every day because that's like my one you know that question it's like if you were on a desert island what food would you eat (laughs) that's my I say that to everyone and that is my meal for the rest of my life is a hamburger with like barbecue sauce. That's that's me. Okay. So do you have a specific restaurant or place uh, that you would go or home cooked or what's your what's oh your jam? Oh gosh. Oh Okay, so I am like a barbecue sauce connoisseur. Like I'm that girl that when you go to a barbecue restaurant and they have like six types of barbecues, I will get all of them and like try them all and then <laughs> rank them and be like, that's my favorite one. And then order a bottle and bring it home. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I really like Red Robin burgers. And I mean, you got to get in and out for sure. Ooh, but if right. we're talking fast food, fast food burgers, I like Carl's Jr. too. Ah, all right. I... <laughs> I always find it so fun to like ask people these questions because like fast food, people are like, wait, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, there's different tiers. Oh, yes. You got like the McDonald's, the Carl's Jr., the Jack in the Box, and then, you know, the another level is like the in and out and like habit and all that kind of stuff. So, (laughs) And I was just laughing while I was holding it under my breath because I didn't want you to think I was laughing at you, but I was laughing because you mentioned Hydro Flask. And this, if my colleagues are listening right now, they're probably laughing too because we were having a big discussion about what is the big thing with hydro flask? What is it? I don't get it because I saw it on sale at Costco, which was a big deal for some people. And then this mom that I follow on Instagram, she has a huge following. She was raving about hydro flask. And now I keep seeing it popping up and I'm just like, what is it with hydro flask? And then I literally just had this conversation (laughs) two days ago and here's Sarah talking about her hydro flask. I'm like, what? Do I need to get one of these? That's so, that's really like ironic. (laughs) Okay. Side note, this episode is not sponsored by (laughs) Hydro Flask. (laughs) I was just about to say, I'm like, there's no affiliation. I'm just obsessed with them. Okay. (laughs) I need to, I'm definitely going to look into that because I mean, this is just, that was the last, the last time I needed to hear it before I actually need to try it myself. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and if you don't like it, then uh, I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I'll blame you. Exactly. Okay. We're going to jump in to kind of talking about sensory integration, which is one of your big passions. But I want to start and I want to know what sensory input do you find yourself avoiding these days? Like what, what are things that like get you right? And like, where you kind of like cringe? Cause I know mm-hmm. we all have those little things. So mm-hmm. I'm curious what yours are. Well, I have a lot. I feel <laughs> like I am definitely overall an over responder to any kind of sensory input. But if I had to pick one, I think I am most definitely auditory defensive. And this comes up all the time with my husband and I, because I swear he must be under responsive. And we are just constantly battling the volume on TV. And oh, I'm that person when we are driving. And if we're lost, I have to turn down the the radio or whatever I'm listening to because I, I can't focus. If I'm like driving up somewhere looking for an address or I'm looking for somewhere to park, I literally have to turn off the radio. <laughs> and yesterday we did this, we were going somewhere and I was trying to, 
think of something that took a lot of cognitive energy and my toddler in the back was whining about something and then my husband was blasting. Well, I say blasting. He says it's just regular music, but he had music on the radio and I just had to turn it off and I was like taking deep breaths. He's like, what is wrong with you? Are you okay? I'm like, no. I was like, I'm so irritated right now because it's so loud and I can't focus. So definitely auditory input. (laughs) Yeah, I hear you on that one. But especially working in pediatrics, if I go in to work with a client and the family is watching TV or they had like a TV show on for the kid, but now the kid is working with me and nobody's paying attention to it, I like can't, I, I can't oh, focus yeah. on what I need to do. Yep. And especially, oh, this is really what gets me, auditory toys mm. that just keep going off oh. in the background. And I literally, I will like stop what I'm doing. I'll look at the parent. Like if I can't get to it, if I can reach it, I'll turn it off. But like if I can't do it, I'll like look at the parent and be like, can you, yeah, can you go like turn that out? Take the batteries out, go put it in another room. Like, uh uh-uh, I can't. I know. Oh, oh, you just wait when you have your kids. It's just, it's non, and sometimes they go off at random times. And I'm like, there's definitely a ghost playing in my daughter's room with her toys because I have not heard that toy in years. But it does that thing where when the batteries are low, it yep. just randomly goes off. So that's annoying. And then the toys that play this, like they don't even offer a volume bar. Yes. It's just like a hundred percent or off. Yeah. So I have, I probably have three or four of her toys with tape over the speakers of her toy because they're just so annoying. They're so they're loud. So loud. They're so loud. Yeah. Well, and then there are, there's some puzzles that I've, that I have that there's no on off switch and they are responsive to light. And so no joke, I'll be driving and I'll go under an overpass and uh all of a sudden the horse Mm -hmm. is going off in the trunk (laughs) or the monkey. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, you have to be kidding. But like, there's no way for me to turn it off without taking the batteries out. And I'm just like, okay. Yep. Yep. I definitely have like a low threshold for feeling like annoyed with certain sounds. But in general, just when there's like a busy background and I'm trying to focus on something, I just not only can I not concentrate it, but I I get moody, I get irritable Mm -hmm. and I I have to stop it. And like I said, it's just makes it the day to day life with my husband and different sensory profiles. (laughs) (laughs) Such a battle. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. I totally get that one. So what would you say, do you have any sort of sensory input that you tend to like seek out or that you crave? I know myself, I'm like a moderate, I say moderate, I'm a moderate vestibular seeker. So I don't love like roller coasters and like super crazy stuff, but I love, like I grew up riding horses, playing soccer. Like I was always just in this like constant motion and I like thrive on that. So I'm like a moderate (laughs) vestibular seeker. That's so opposite of me. I was the girl who cried before every like roller coaster ride. I would wait in line and then exit. I still do that to this day. I did it on our like every we we got engaged at Disney World and I probably spent hours and hours in lines for rides and went on like two because I just panicked last minute. I don't think I crave a specific input, but I do like bigger flavors. Like I really like spicy and sour foods. So like I loved Warheads when I was little and I still have like an affinity for like vinegar flavored condiments, (laughs) like and salad dressings and gum. I love chewing the gums that I get for um, my clients. I always get like big sour flavor gums for them and I always end up chewing it at the end of the day. Oh, we're totally on the same page. I'm, yep. I'm like, if it's too bland, I'm the, okay, so your barbecue sauce, I'm Cholula yeah. or like any sort uh, of like hot mm-hmm, sauce, mm-hmm. bring it on. Like Marie yes. Sharp's that Belize yes. in hot sauce. Oh man. Like I, <laughs> I'm sitting there like dumping the sauce on everything. <laughs> yep. I'm a sauce and condiment girl. Like I always have like three next to me for everything. Like I just love dousing all of my food and all the sauces. <laughs> now, do you go to the level where you carry it like in your purse? Oh, no. Okay. No, yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't do that. I don't know if my mom still does this, but she used to bring like soy sauce to certain restaurants. Mm-hmm. I think that's just an overall Filipino mom thing, bringing like food and snacks and condiments in your purse. But <laughs> I, I haven't I haven't gone there yet. 
Yeah, no, me neither. That, okay, that to me is like next level. And I love the people that do it because I'm like, wow, like you guys actually put some thought behind this. I'm the person I'm like, I'll just deal with what they have and I'll I'll, I'll complain if they don't have what I want. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's true. No, I'm pretty good about not bringing my own stuff to restaurants (laughs) so far. Right. So, okay. So we've been talking a little bit about the sensory and kind of like our own like sensory quirks because we all have them. Like (laughs) there's no avoiding that uh, we all have our sensory quirks, but maybe I'd love to hear how you kind of break down sensory integration, sensory processing for your clients and like how do you explain that so people kind of start to understand it? Because it, it's a very kind of lofty, very broad topic. And I know, at least in my experience, a lot of times parents have a hard time understanding what it is. Yeah. And even students that are learning it and practitioners that are starting to learn about sensory, like there's a yeah. lot to try to understand. So mm-hmm. how how do you go about explaining it? So when I'm at the point of a parent conference, it's always after the evaluation, I don't really do any screenings except for over the phone where I'm kind of getting their information and seeing what is impacted in their child. And then the in-depth conversation and the parent education comes after I do the evaluation and after I've sent them the report to look over. More often than not, though, especially recently, our eval reports are pretty comprehensive. They're like 24 pages, sometimes 30. Are you kidding they're really, really wow. long. Wow. I thought mine were long at like four to six. <laughs> no, they're long. And that's because we go in depth about every sensory system. But I think because we want to make sure that they're fully, fully understanding it, because some people do process it better with written versus some parents come in and are like, can you just tell me like what exactly is going on, you know, face to face. So, but we have it all there, all of our charts and a lot of graphs and things like that. So it just makes it very lengthy. In terms of the narrative part, I'm sure it probably would go down to about six or seven, maybe okay. upwards of 10, but <laughs> depending on the on the complexity. But after they read that or go through whatever they can, then when we meet in person, I highlight all the impacted sensory systems. And then it also includes higher level skills that are associated with it. It is split up into the sensory domains that are vestibular input, proprioceptive, tactile, auditory, visual, interoception, gustatory, and olfactory. And above that, it starts getting progressively skilled in terms of higher level skills and more cerebral cortex skills, if you will, and like frontal lobe and all of the the skills that you need to have a more refined and functional daily life. If one of those systems are inefficient or underdeveloped or over-responsive, under-responsive, just something that's not quite efficiently working, it can be really difficult to build and develop some of those higher level skills. So what I like to do is I will highlight one of the sensory systems that is impacted in the child. And then I show how it links to the higher level skills. So for example, if I evaluate a student who has an inefficient vestibular system, that movement system, I might also highlight bilateral coordination and balance and auditory discrimination and motor planning skills. And then above that is confidence and social interactions and overall quality of life. And I explained to the parents how we got there working backwards and how it really, really stems from the vestibular system and how that input to our inner ear is so closely tied to our body awareness and how we know if we are falling over to catch ourselves in time or knowing how fast we are moving so that we can stop before bumping into the wall or bumping into a friend. And One of the biggest aha moments I get from the parents, at least specific to the vestibular system, are my clients that have a history of chronic ear infections. And I like to show the parents a visual of the inner ear and how it's functionally and anatomically linked to the vestibular system. So typically, if there is an auditory dysfunction or or something, a chronic ear infection, then there's a big chance that their vestibular system is also going to be impacted. And 
seeing and linking that for the parents, I think it helps them understand it a little bit more because there's more of a, I want to say like a more medical piece coming to the front of it where some of our other sensory systems are a little bit harder to imagine, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I I just want to highlight, like, I really like how you kind of broke that down because like I mentioned, like there's, there's so much to talk about with sensory and really getting that like full grasp of it is it's difficult and it takes years of experience and research and learning and trying things out to like really come to terms with like all that sensory is and can do. And I think a lot of times like the parents get kind of stuck of like, I still don't understand like what vestibular is like and how that actually applies to specific skills and Mm -hmm. or deficits, right? Things that they're seeing in their child that they're like, oh, well, they just run into things or whatever it is that now they're like, oh, there's an explanation for it. And that could be caused by chronic ear infections or something along those lines. So for me, like what I see is it really starts to connect the dots where the parents are like, I've known there's been something going on for a long time. I just didn't know what it was and and what the cause was. Yep. Yeah. And I've been seeing that a lot lately. And I think I have maybe a closer eye on it now that I also am coming at it from a parent's perspective and seeing things with my own daughter that... I know what it's like to have that gut feeling of like, I knew there was something going on, but I wasn't sure what it was, or I wasn't sure if it was a phase or people told me that that was normal, but I knew there was something there. And so a lot of the time parents leave the meeting feeling more, more kind of in tune with what their child needs and feeling a little bit sense of relief, knowing that their feelings and what their observations were, were validated. Because, I mean, sensory is so complicated, and I can't tell you how many times I have that conversation with parents, with colleagues, and even with myself about, is this sensory? Is this behavior? Is this a phase in the child's life? Is this the psych? Like, it's so, so complicated. Yeah. But And is it is it typical, or is there an issue right. because of it? Because exactly. a lot of things, the kids are just exploring, and people are like, right. oh, my kid's twirling around in a circle. And yeah. it's like, yeah, they just realize that that activates yeah. their vestibular system. And is it normal or is there an actual dysfunction that's occurring? And I think there's there's a big line between that as well, like along with the behavior and everything else that you just mentioned. Yeah, and I think like exactly what you were saying that is it is it something that needs to be addressed? Is it really impacting their daily function? How are they doing at school? And having that conversation with the parents kind of puts things into context for them and can really help them process whatever my recommendations were or findings were. And I think just kind of stating it that way and letting them know that, you know, you you were right when you were seeing this or that. This is what OT can do for you. And I'm going to be measuring or asking you about how this is continuing to impact their function at home and at school. So I really continue to make it clear to the parents that they're going to be their child's advocate and that they're going to always be updating me more so about their functioning at home because we're not quite I will be making my own notes in in the session, but at the end of the day, I'm with them, you know, an hour a week. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be basing most of my progress on what the parents report at home and what the what they are getting from the teacher. And so, I want the parents to know that what they've reported thus far that got them to the evaluation was valid. So, I want them to know that they're on the right track and exactly what they were thinking that led them to me is the same kind of lens that I want them to look through and added more tools that I give them and more things to specifically look at is what I'm going to be following as I treat their child. Yeah, I I love the word validation that you said, because even before you said it, like, that's the word that I was thinking in my head. It's, it's when you sit down with a parent that is having all these issues with their children, and they know that something is off. They don't Mm -hmm. know what it is, but they Mm -hmm. know that something's off. And other people are saying, oh, it's just a phase. Oh, it's a boy thing. Oh, it's a girl thing. Oh, it's this. Like they'll grow out of it, whatever it is. But that parent knows. And then you come in, you do your observations. You might start treating the child and you're like, okay, I can tell that it is, you know, the kid is over-responsive to 
proprioceptive input or whatever it is. Right. And you start explaining how the proprioceptive system impacts the other like kind of higher levels of development. Mm -hmm. And that parent sits there and they just like do this like big sigh of relief. And they're like, yeah. oh my gosh, like I knew this and everything you're saying makes yeah. sense to me. And they just feel validated because the parents are the experts on their kids. Like they're the ones totally. that know what their kid can't do, can do, how they react. Like they understand that. And mm -hmm. then we as therapists come in and share the resources, the tools, and we kind of bring that awareness of like, this is what we're seeing. And I'm going to give you the tools to be able to address these things with your child to have them make progress and be able to start functioning better within the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree with that. And I also really like spending time validating their what they were seeing, but also spending a lot of time educating them on that sensory piece because I want to, especially for my for my clients who need the most support. And I like to kind of use that to set their expectations in kind of saying like this is an underlying sensory system challenge that we need to target from true sensory integration. So that means, yes, you want your child to be able to participate in a basketball game, but it doesn't mean that, you know, when I see him weekly, we're going to be going outside and dribbling a basketball, like that we're not always going to be working from the top down. We are going to address those skills. And when it gets to a time where, you know, Johnny has has made some improvements in his vestibular modulation. And then now we can work on vestibular discrimination and that piece, the higher level learning, then we can start to add that in. But I like to really set their expectations that it's definitely like a baby steps kind of therapy and that we need to target it from the sensory standpoint because I like to let them know, you know, therapy is going to look a lot like play and we're going to be in the sensory gym a lot, even if we also need to work on handwriting mm -hmm. and some of these other things that you, that are important to you. I promise I'm going to get there, but this part of the pyramid, it, it's not the, the whole pyramid is not going to be solid and functional without this bottom piece really, really built. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like so often development and skills and milestones, like everything is very much compartmentalized. And mm -hmm. people think you do, you roll, then you sit up, then you crawl, right. then you right. walk, then you right. learn to feed yourself, like whatever it is, right? right? And I think a lot of people miss the fact that Things that are happening within development lead to these higher level cognitive skills, social, emotional understanding, like all these kind of more complex, bigger right. topics, bigger things. And I think a lot of times the parents are like, well, I want my kid to be working on handwriting, but I, all I see is you jumping on a trampoline. Like, how is that right. going to improve their handwriting? And oh, yeah. I, I just, I love the fact that you were like, that you really pay attention to that education piece, because mm -hmm. I think that is lost a lot of times where they're like, you guys are just playing. You are not doing therapy because my kid is having fun. Like therapy is right. supposed to be structured and it's supposed right. to be whatever, whatever this kind of like societal view is. Yep. And especially with sensory, there are so many things that are happening at that cellular level that you have mm -hmm. to address before mm -hmm. you can even start to make changes on some of those higher level things. Yep. And so that education piece is just so important. And I, I love that you say that that's something that you really focus on. So your clients can start to understand what it is that you're really getting at and how that's going to impact the goals later on. Yeah. And I've learned that through the years of uh, trial and error and kind of learning the hard way that, you know, at the beginning, I was getting a lot of questions like, well, how much longer does Johnny need to be here? Or why can't he do this yet? And so I was kind of like reflecting, I'm like, what am I what am I missing here? And then when I took a course from Star Center, I forget which course it was, but they were talking about how the lack of follow through on sensory diets at home on any kind of therapeutic program that we provide them. If the parents aren't doing it, well, sometimes you need to make sure you're not overwhelming them with too much. But even if it's not that much, 
they were saying that we need to kind of go back and say they probably weren't educated well enough on how important it is and what it's contributing to, not just handing them a piece of paper and saying, hey, do 10 jumping jacks, right? Really understanding that sensory piece. And it so far, it's gone a long way. I've had more trust from my family with what I'm doing with therapy. I've had less questions about how much longer, and I've had more follow through with programs at home when I spend a lot of time at the beginning with that education. And then each time I do my debriefs after sessions, I don't have to keep going over that education piece because essentially they've learned it all from me in that one parent meeting and they they know kind of the gist of it. So it saves me time in the long run to spend extra time at that parent conference and really make sure that they understand the sensory information. I want to dive into this a little bit more because I think this is a really important topic and something that I think comes up as a difficulty that a lot of therapists face. How do we bridge the gap between working within the clinic environment with highly specialized sensory integration equipment and bridging the gap between that and home or that and school or the community, right? Anything outside of that clinic environment. And I know even in, in my experience over the years, I... I faced this problem where the kid would come to me in the clinic. I could get this kid to do beautiful work. Anything that I needed and I wanted that kid to do, I could get him to do it in the clinic. And I'd tell the parent, this is what you guys need to do. Like I was trying to make it as accessible and easily implemented as possible at home. And week after week, the parent would come back and be like, oh, we just, we couldn't do it. Oh, we didn't have the space. We didn't have the time. We couldn't do it. And so besides this education piece, do you have any other kind of tips or any other strategies that you use to really try to bridge that gap between the clinic and the home or the school environment? I love that question. And I think this discussion is so important to be had. I can't tell you how many times I've changed the way that I provide home programs or teacher or or suggestions for classrooms just because I felt like it was my responsibility to make sure that it was either written more concisely or easier to follow or not as intimidating. So what I found so far where I'm at, I think that works for me, are there's two things. One of them is making sure, I I should say three things. The first thing is that I make sure that especially in the beginning for home programs for family, I try to pick things that require little to no equipment. Like you don't need to buy a trampoline. You don't need to go to the playground to do a swing. You don't need to get a scooter board. I try to show them little things, if anything, maybe using a bed sheet to make a swing for your toddler or pillows around the house for a crash pad, things like that, or even just simple log rolls. So things that require little to no equipment or anything or use things that you could have around the house. The other thing is to make sure that I understand what their family dynamic already looks like and whether or not that includes siblings or if they are an only child or if they have only 10 minutes in the morning before school starts or, you know, what their daily schedule looks like and how I can help them integrate it better into their schedule because that is the biggest thing that I've found to be a barrier to them completing the home program is because (laughs) I think now being a mom, I definitely understand it from this point of view, but I'm laughing because the first year that I was a therapist, I was like giving them home programs or like, Oh yeah. In the morning, have them, you know, you, that trampoline you have outside in your backyard, let them jump on the trampoline for maybe 10 to 15 minutes to get that heavy work, that vestibular, and then let them go play in the sandbox for this minute. Like, It was just, it was, they were great sensory activities, but who's going to do that at 730 in the morning? And (laughs) it's just unrealistic. (laughs) It's just, I'm laughing at that because I seriously like handed them a paper that said that. And they like, thankfully, none of them laughed in my face. Like they probably took it seriously, but they didn't, they weren't able to complete it. And of course I, I completely get it now. So now I let the parents, I say, give me your schedule, what it looks like in the morning. I will say if the kids are seekers, they they will end up seeking uh, intuitively looking for that input themselves at school, like when it's recess and lunch. So I don't worry about those as much because I'm like, they will get their input at recess, even though 
they need like 30 minutes more than what they already get. Let's not get to that conversation. But so I will focus on their program in the morning and then maybe after school. And so I say, give me a rundown of what your schedule is like from when they wake up, like how much time it takes them to get ready. And then I'll kind of also ask them, do you have a backyard or are you living in an apartment, which is a big thing here in the Bay Area. So, and then I will, I will show them how adding sensory input to your day doesn't have to be like a 10 to 20 minute session of like exercises and games in the morning. You could transition from room to room doing crab walks. And the, the idea is just to front load your nervous system for the day so that your arousal level is just right for the classroom. So once I show them that there's ways to be creative and I give the parents more of the tools to think like a therapist so I don't have to give them an exhaustive list of every activity they could do, then they can start DIYing different sensory activities throughout the house. As I have that conversation with them, they'll be like, oh, um, is like going downstairs part of input? I was like, yeah, you could scoot downstairs. You could have them carry the laundry downstairs or bring their backpack from upstairs. It's giving them so many different ideas, but having them think it through. Um, I see the light bulb go off more often and then they end up being a little bit more creative with how they can integrate it into their schedule. Well, and I think that's important to note that you're not just going in and being like, here's your home program, here's a list, here's this paper, and here's a list of all these activities that you need to do because this is going to help your child, right? Right. All of a sudden, the parents are like, oh, I need to do this. And it makes them anxious because they're like, when am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? What does it look like? But rather, you're going in and you're working with their schedule and you're saying, what is it that you do? Oh, you could try this in this this five minute period or when yep. you are working on going down the stairs, you can target all these other things and all of a sudden you're integrating into what they're already doing rather than just yeah. adding to oh, yeah. their stress and to their to-do list. Exactly. And I think I said there were three things. So I, I mentioned the two. The third one that I wanted to say that kind of stems off of what you're, what you're saying is that there are still some families where they get very overwhelmed with what I provide them and what I say to do this, even when I say, even when I try to integrate it in their schedule. So for those families, I will pick one thing per week and say, this is your homework this week. I want to see, I want you to do as many different transitions between rooms as you can, whether it's frog hops, whether it's door pushes, whether it's army crawling, I want you to do as many of those throughout the week as you can. Tell me which ones you did and then tell me how they worked. So there's some families where you really have to grade it down and give them one specific thing to do. And then once they see that that was easy, then the next week I'll be like, okay, great. So now you have those transitions worked in. Keep doing that. Now, can you also add them, you know, tall kneeling while they're doing this activity to work on the core? But it's already doing during like homework or something what that's already part of their schedule. So kind of slowly building it up for them where they feel comfortable and successful too, because at the end of the day, that's what we do, right? We grade everything down for the just right challenge. And it's not just for the clients that we're working with. Well, the family is part of the client, but it's not just for the child. It's for the parents too, to feel successful because they are going to have to be OTs at home too. You literally just took the words out of my mouth. I'm like, yeah, it's like activity analysis, but not just for the kids. Like this is literally for the family's routine and everything that they do. And you're breaking it down into smaller chunks that they can accomplish and then building upon that. It's like, yep, okay, OT. (laughs) It's it's all OT OT right there. I cannot turn it off. Like I feel like I have like the Iron Man vision of just OT, like everything is like registering in my environment is like breaking da- breaking tasks down. I just can't, I can't unsee activity analysis. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> uh-huh. I, uh, yep, I, I get it. Like I can't turn my OT brain off ever, yes. ever. Yeah. Like everything I do, I'm like, I'll think about it. I'll reflect on it differently. And like, I'll say something to my husband and he's like, He's like, do you like, are you, do you never like not think about yes. OT? I'm like, eh, nope. <laughs> no. Well, because it's so functional and it's literally daily life. How do you not like, you know, I, I just don't see how you can not because it's daily. It's everything. It's everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yep. I get it. I totally get it. Reach into the choir here. I yeah. guess. <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> yeah, totally understand that. So for somebody who maybe hasn't had a lot of exposure to what a sensory treatment would actually look like, maybe we could kind of paint a picture about like a typical session and, and what are maybe some of your favorite things that you would do within a session to just kind of further this chat about what sensory looks like and, and how you are addressing it with your clients. Yeah, that's a great question. So for my clients that I work on primarily for sensory processing challenges, because I do have some clients where I work on, you know, fine motor skills, they're, they're already kind of have a solid sensory base, and we're just kind of working on the motor piece. But for my sensory, my real sensory processing disorder clients or clients that have a real um, ineffective sensory system, I definitely spend a majority of my time in our sensory gym. And I usually for when I'm treatment planning, I on my note sheet, I have the client's name and then a list of their goals and their sensory profile and things that they're over responsive to or under responsive. And then I always have my notes from the previous week to kind of glance over and see if there's something I want to adapt or try harder to grade it up that week. But I always start with an activity that I know will bring them either upregulate them. So if they come in a little tired, I'll kind of do like a, a fast blast waking up type of activity. Or if I have one of my clients who is more impulsive and a fast mover, then I'll do a more structured and more heavy work based activity to get them. I'm always trying to chase that just right level of arousal, right? That green zone so that I could start building skills. There are some clients that I have that I don't jump out with and just say, all right, let's do an obstacle course because the motor skills for an obstacle course and the executive functioning and the timing and all of that is just too much to jump into. They're not, their nervous system isn't exactly where it needs to be yet to be able to process those skills. So I have quite a bit of clients who need to start with a lycra swing or just a simple run, jump, crash, something very simple that doesn't take a lot of skills or executive functioning and is just about the real sensory input for their needs. And then depending on how long that takes, sometimes I will then grade it up or add a step or turn it into an obstacle course, still integrating a lot of the specific sensory domain that they're needing help with. And the other piece to working at the clinic that I'm at is we share one sensory gym and there's four therapists there. Our gym is pretty small, relatively speaking, to some other gyms. So we are we do get the opportunity a lot to do um, like co-treatments almost, but not, they're all OTs. So it would still be that it's another OT with their client and then myself with my client. And if they're an age match peer or they're developmentally appropriate, then we always try to do some kind of gross motor game or a net swing game so we could add that social dynamic to it. There has been times where we have to be creative because that we have different sensory profiles going on. One is just way too overstimulated and the other one just can't get enough. So we've had to kind of be creative in terms of splitting their room or kind of providing one client with the input they need on this half and then the other half is kind of for that client. So you definitely have to think on your feet a lot. And then probably one of my favorite things to do, especially with some of my younger clients, the clients that are nonverbal or have a harder time really engaging with me is I really like taking their lead and using what they have to motivate them. So I have a client who really, really loves the dinosaurs and the shark bin that we have. And whenever we go in the in the room, he just runs straight for that bin and does not want to engage with anything else. And he'll kind of just perseverate on them, staring at them, um, making sounds with them. And so how I finally got him to do his first swing was we put the dinosaurs on the swing and gave them a little ride. And then the dinosaur jumped off and crashed in the pillows. And then once we ran out of the dinosaurs that jumped and crashed, then he copied what they did and then jumped and crashed into the pillows. And I got the first eye contact from him and the first like laugh from him. And it was just a major breakthrough because I followed his lead instead of just having this plan and him coming in and being like, Hey, do this swing and jump and crash. 
um, when he just really wanted to play with the dinosaurs. Yeah, I want to take a moment and like let that just sink in because I think that is just brilliant advice across the board because a lot of times I hear people that are like, oh, I have this kid and I just I can't connect with them. I can't get them to engage. All they want to do is and then insert whatever toy or whatever activity that they kind of perseverate on. And it's like, across the board. I see it in Facebook groups. I hear it out in the field and, and therapists are like, I don't know what to do. And yeah, you, you really have to kind of go back to that very beginning level and find out what it is that motivates them. What is it that they want to do and then build upon it and almost like draw them out in the process, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like the dinosaurs are getting the sensory input at that moment, but right. the goal is is to get that kid to be able to yeah. do it as well. And sometimes they see the dinosaurs on the swing and they're like, oh, that looks like fun. All of a sudden mm-hmm. it's not scary. It's not novel anymore. It's something that they want to be doing. And I just think just taking kind of taking a step back and really breaking it down to the the easiest skill at that moment that you can be addressing to then build upon it. I love what you said right there, because I think it's important for therapists to hear. And sometimes it's just even telling the parents that at the end, like, we shared a moment. He looked at my, you know, he gave me eye contact and he smiled and he asked for more. And that was like the biggest win for that day. No, he he only did the swing one time for maybe two seconds and his feet were still on the ground. So we didn't, you know, break through that, you know, over that gravitational insecurity, but we had a moment of engagement there and he increased his participation with me. So that is a win, especially for some of uh, my clients who definitely need more support in that social piece or engaging with other people. So it's always bringing it back to the positives for the parents. And I always force myself, even if I have the hardest session where I feel like I'm not doing much and I'm like, oh, this kid needs so much help and I don't know if I'm doing it right. I will always find at least one positive thing to tell the parents, whether it's the smallest thing that, you know, he found a new dinosaur that he liked or, you know, he shared it with me, bringing it back to the positive and still referencing that, you know, he was in a new environment today and he, you know, didn't have a big reaction when we had to share the clinic gym. That's a big win too. So there's always something in the multi-sensory gym that can pose a new challenge and a new opportunity to adapt and for them to have something positive come out of it. I think for me, like one of the biggest things that I've learned being an occupational therapist is really just appreciating and celebrating the small wins because these small wins that we get with our clients that we get with ourselves that whatever it is like they build and they turn into larger wins later on and I think a lot of times like people can just be like oh but you know just putting on your socks like that's not a big deal Right. But if you can't put on your socks, oh gosh, you can't yeah. put on your shoes and that's going to impact so many other things. So mm-hmm. while just putting on socks or just brushing your teeth or just getting on that swing, right? Going back to that kind of basic level on the surface, it seems so small, right? It seems just kind of trivial. But when you look at the, the grand scheme of things, all of these little wins lead into bigger things later on. Mm-hmm. And when you put it in the context of being able to go on a swing will help his confidence so that he can do age appropriate activities with his friends on the playground versus, you know, sitting in a classroom reading a book. And when you put it in a context of what's going on um, in the environment, I think that also adds a big piece to it to get the parents to understand the value of one tiny task that seems to them. Exactly. Because it, it might not seem important, but then once you kind of showcase like what else this one little skill can do they're like oh oh okay I didn't realize that it could be that influential and that beneficial for my child yeah I had I had a mom that her son was very globally impacted by all across all sensory domains and he was gravitationally insecure and he was tactile defensive and he was just a scared little boy in any environment and she wasn't sure when I would give her what was going on in sessions, I would say, you know what, he tried the swing for a couple seconds today, he was able to at least get in the swing, and he didn't want to get in it the week before. So we're making progress. She wasn't quite sure about it. And then about three weeks in after after working in the gym, she emailed me and she goes, 
oh my gosh, we went to a birthday party and he went in a jump house. He's never done that in his entire life. Oh, and then she said, also, when I picked him up from school this week, a school that he's been at for three years, this was the first time I saw him on the playground structure with other kids. So I'm glad that she had those that moment for herself and it wasn't me having to pull it out of her. But I really love that she shared that with me because it made me know that she was thinking of me and attributing it to all of the hard work that he's been doing in OT. And then I think from then on, she really, really understood and got the importance of it and how it can apply to a more functional, bigger picture. Mm -hmm, Exactly. So you have so much knowledge about sensory integration, sensory processing. Where did that interest actually stem from? Like, did you always kind of have this interest in sensory or like, did you have an event or something that happened that made you be like, I really want to learn more about this to help my clients or to, I don't know, where, where did that come from? So when I first heard about OT, it was in the context of pediatrics. And I got my undergrad degree in neuropsychology. So I was in, I was into the neuro stuff and the brain stuff and all, I was so obsessed with that stuff. And I still find that really fascinating. But when I decided to pursue OT and instead of getting my PhD in psychology, I heard about it from a pediatric CODA. And so she suggested I become an ABA therapist to get experience with kids. And so that's really what jump started my OT journey. Then like I think it was like the first week of OT school. The first week or maybe even the first day, I realized how much bigger OT was than what I had in my brain. I still did not know like half as much as I do now. And I still don't know everything about OT. But when I first went to my first day of class, I was like, whoa, OT does all of this stuff? Like I really, I had no idea. So from the first day of OT or that first week until like even the end of my program, I still maintained that I wasn't quite sure where I wanted to go. I had certain settings that I knew probably wasn't going to be a good fit for myself that I didn't really enjoy, but I still had some other routes that I was like, I could do that or I could do this. I wasn't sold. And then my field work, I was first placed in a sniff for my first Fieldwork 2 placement. And then my second one was at the clinic that I'm at now. And that's where I really, really learned all of my sensory education from. In grad school, we did not spend a lot of time on sensory integration. So I really didn't know. It was like the tip of the iceberg. I didn't know a lot about sensory input at that time. And then I learned almost all of it from my mentors at my field work. And I was lucky enough to be hired from there. And I'm still there now and still learning every day as much as I can. But once I really saw what true sensory integration can do when it's done right and when you when you really, really follow the child's lead and what their body needs and what they're communicating and how that can translate and apply to multiple different environments at the school and at home, it's just so rewarding daily seeing it. I still have like a passion for it. That's just like constantly burning. And I'm just like, this is so cool. And I hope that passion never goes away. But I definitely did not always have the passion for sensory because I didn't know the power of sensory input and how needed it is for everyone to function. And now you, as you kind of mentioned previously, now you have a daughter And you have started to kind of notice some sensory stuff going on with her as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So definitely now I have I have the other perspective of the sensory processing challenges as as the parent now. So I have noticed probably for the past, I want to say like three to six months, some heightened sensitivities to tactile input for my daughter. And from the beginning, she's since she was an infant, she's been a pretty, I would say, kind of not colicky, but generally fussy baby. And she wasn't the best sleeper. So I've always kind of had to work a little bit harder as a mom to have her feel comfortable and happy and things like that. But recently, oh, and I should also mention, she also had speech delay, a, a mild speech expressive speech delay that we um, went to speech for for a month and a half. So I thought that her speech delay was was feeding into her emotional regulation challenges. And for people listening, I do know that toddlers 
have almost no emotional regulation. I do get that piece. I know toddlers are toddlers, but she has some bigger emotions than I think were typical for her age. And so I was thinking that it was the, the lack, the delay in communication that was really feeding into it. Once we got that resolved, the emotional regulation piece was still lingering. She was still having really, really big meltdowns. And then I started to to see little red flags for tactile defensiveness. And at first I was just saying, oh, maybe she just doesn't like messy play. You know, the things that go through your mind as a parent, maybe it's just a phase. And then the OT started getting bigger and bigger. And I'm like, but what if it's not? And what if I fast forward seeing the kids I see now in the clinic and I look at their history and it's like, oh yeah, she used to also hate this at one and two. And I can like link it. I'm like, I don't want it to get there. But the things I was noticing was she did not like anything messy play, even if it was not even super wet. Like if it was like Play-Doh, she was avoiding touching anything messy outside with like dirt or grass she didn't like touching finger painting and any kind of toddler type crafts she did not enjoy and then it started to turn into because at that point I was like okay not so bad yet I could maybe get her used to it maybe I haven't exposed her yet because she's so young I just will you know start to slowly expose her to it I'll I'll play a little bit more and then it started to bleed into more ADL stuff like grooming and hygiene. Like she started to be more fussy with me brushing her hair and she would cry when her hair was wet after a bath and touching her skin. And then I noticed some toe walking, which is also a classic sign of, well, it could be a lot of things, but in the tactile pattern, a lot of kids who are avoiding that tactile input will go on their tiptoes. And then also being picky with her socks, which she hadn't before. When I started to put them on, she would complain about how they were feeling. And when we were swimming, she I have like those long sleeve like rash guards on her to cover the sun. And when those sleeves got wet, she would want me to take the whole thing off. So it started to creep out from just like the crafts and like the messy play to like now like grooming and hygiene and dressing. And yeah, it it just started to slowly expand. And then I was thinking, oh gosh, I think it is going to be something because this is the question that I would ask. Is it impacting your your daily life? And I'm like, it's starting to go that route. Yeah. So I, and I think that's a really good point to kind of highlight there that, yeah, there are some kids that just don't like messy play and it's something like, eh, I, I, I just don't care for it. I'd rather do another activity, but The big thing is when it starts to impede function, when it starts to impede the family routines, the social routines, and the occupations, that's when it becomes an issue because now dressing was becoming an issue for you or going swimming, bath time, like all of these other things were starting to become harder. And my guess is you got frustrated and she was dealing with some emotions, whether it was frustration or she, you know, she was sad, whatever it was that she was going through. Cause she's like, I don't understand what's going on and I don't like this. And now my mom's right. mad at me. So there's kind yeah. of this other stuff that starts to build and then it becomes a bigger issue, not just, oh, she just doesn't like messy play. Right. Yeah. I think where it started to get my, my husband to start noticing it as well was when it was impacting like after showers and dressing things. Because crafts and messy play are easy to avoid or to not see every day, that once it started to impact like the true ADLs, the daily living stuff, that's when it was like, oh, okay, maybe it is a little bit more, maybe she is having a little bit more of a challenge than I was anticipating for my husband on his side. And I mean, she just finished her last day of like summer preschool and I was talking to a friend who has a daughter in the same class and she goes, oh, did you see all the crafts that they made this week? And I'm like, what crafts? And she's like, oh, she came home, like her daughter, she's like, oh, she came home with like six different crafts. I'm like, oh, well, that just tells me another thing. My daughter is like avoiding a complete part of her day that she just doesn't want to do it. And, you know, every time we go play at the pool or some outdoor like park area, she's avoiding the bigger, the crowds of the kids that are all around the water. Any of that imposed touch or things that aren't going to be in her control make her really, really anxious. So I'm definitely noticing all of that stuff. Yeah. And I'm sure with all the knowledge that you have as being an OT and working in sensory and like day in and day out, like you are eat and breathing sensory. Now, all of a sudden you have this lens from the therapist side of it, but then you also have 
the, the parent side. You have that being a mom. And I'm really curious how you have found yourself trying to navigate that process of having a lot of the knowledge, but then also trying to be there for your daughter, trying to support her and, and foster as much as you possibly can. And really just how you navigate the, the parent and therapist role with her. So that's a great question. And I think that what I've recently decided and that I've kind of gravitated towards is that I've just accepted that, yes, I am an OT and I quite possibly know everything that I need to do and that I should be doing, but I know when to pass the baton to another person, a third party OT, because I can't be mom and OT. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not the best therapeutic use of self of me being the OT, but also to her, I'm her mom. So she's looking to me to feel safe and to comfort her and to have her big emotions. But then I can't also switch sides and then be OT and have and like challenge her. It's too confusing for her. And definitely for me, I can't just, I can't turn off the emotions that I have. And once I've kind of come to that I stopped having expectations of myself to have these great OT sessions with her. Once I've kind of taken that hat off and started to ask colleagues for help and, you know, find other resources, then I think that has taken a lot of pressure off of me and given the path a little bit more clarity of like, I can just focus on this now and not try to feel pressure of, you know, why do I need an OT? I can do it. I know what to do. I can just play with her and, feel okay and comforting her when I need to. And then, you know, supplementing with some great OT activities, but not feel the pressure of like doing true, like sensory with her, like everyday OT stuff, because it's just, it's exhausting. Yeah, well, and and I'm sure that that can be really difficult for both of you guys, because you want her to make progress and do these things that are challenging for her. And she wants to feel safe with you. And I mean, that that's just a recipe for disaster right there where yep. you guys are ultimately just going to get frustrated with each other if, you, if they're if you're not moving in the direction that you want to be moving. And so I think that's just a really healthy way to go about it. Like you, you have the knowledge, you know what to do, but then also understanding maybe it's not my place. Maybe I need to be a mom first yeah. and, and have a, a, an outside opinion be working on some of the really challenging OT things. Because of course, when you're playing with her, when you're interacting with her, you're always going to have that OT lens, mm-hmm. but it doesn't need to get to the point of like pushing and challenging and making it uh, even harder for her. Right. And really, ultimately making it where she can benefit the most and both of you guys are happy. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, like you said, and we both, we can't turn off that OT brain. I still see, you know, we are all about observation. I can see it in like a glance and I'm like, Oh, there's that tactile defensiveness. There it is. Like I can see it in so quick in every little thing, something that like my husband wouldn't notice or anyone else who doesn't have sensory training would notice like oral overflow when she's touching something, you know, like those little subtle signs of like just being overstimulated where she's still exploring it. Yes. My husband or someone would say like, great, she's touching it. I'm like, yeah, but look at all of that oral overflow that's happening right now. It's still so much for her to like, I'm still constantly taking inventory of those things just so that, you know, when I do, when we do find the OT that can work with her or another professional that might be a best fit, I can, I know that they're going to ask these things. And I just, um, also wanting to take note of things that, you know, she's improving on. Yes, she was able to touch those Orbeez in the water, but it's still definitely extra work for her to process because she's like drooling extra and, you know, she's splaying her fingers a little bit, but it's just, I'm constantly like in my clinical mode, but I'm not quite intervening as much as I would um, a few months ago. I'm just still (laughs) observing. How do you feel like going through some of the, these things with your daughter has impacted you as a therapist? And now, like, has it changed how you work with the parents and how you work with clients? Oh, it has 100% helped me so much with the insight and the empathy that I have for my clients. I just had that this week with a mom who was feeling so frustrated and she was saying, well, how come she did that with you? But at home, you know, I try this and she just runs away and I feel like I failed and I can't do it. She just doesn't want to do it with me. And I'm like, listen, like I just had this 
mom to mom, heart to heart communication with her saying, it's not you. It's really all your job is as mom is to be able to have fun with her, show her that she can play and explore and feel safe. If she doesn't do it with you, that's what OT is for. And I will give you the tools to feel successful at home. She might not do it at, with you at home, but if she's doing it here, she's she's exploring and she is working working on it. And it's it's helped me from being able to set their expectations, to be able to empathize with them, um, especially the moms. We put so much pressure on ourselves to do everything right. And I think connecting with them on that level and them seeing that I myself have a daughter who has sensory needs and that I'm still having a hard time navigating it. I think that that's really been very valuable to my practice. And like I mentioned earlier, the the home program, I think I'm just a little bit more practical now in the ways that I uh, provide pr- a home programs so that they could feel successful and to follow through with it. Because I mean, I try to do the brushing protocol with her and I know you're supposed to do it. I had the opportunity to do it every two hours, like the true protocol says, and I still didn't do it. It's so hard. It's really hard to do, even when I know the why behind it. So I just have that always in the back of my mind and knowing that they have a whole other world that they have to navigate to on top of trying to to help their own child. So I just try to keep things in perspective that way. And having a daughter and having a daughter with sensory needs has absolutely been a value to my practice. What advice would you give for therapists that are working with clients and their caregivers, especially for me, for instance, I I don't have kids and I, I haven't gone through that. What advice would you give to somebody that is working with this population that might not have that personal connection? How can they better empathize with the parents or better kind of broach that subject with the parents to really help them out, even if they don't have a personal connection? I think the first bit of advice that I would have is to is not quite something that you would do externally or to give to the parents, but it's just to kind of give yourself some pause and reflect on those times that the family is not following through with the home program. Because I used to do this instead of just saying, oh, gosh, I just asked mom to, you know, do this brushing with him every night for 10 minutes and she still didn't do it. Give yourself pause and to really think and reflect on what else might be going on in the home environment and thinking of how, you know, remembering that the the parents are your clients too and thinking of how you can grade it down and meet them where they're at. And then in terms of something to give to the parents or a strategy is kind of just to get more detail and, and let them know how, so how can I help you? I'm seeing that I know it must be really hard, just, you know, validating. I know it must be so hard to do this extra OT homework at home. What's something that you think you can do this week? So um, asking them and showing interest that you really still want to help them, but you're not going to judge them or just give them a piece of paper to do without considering what's going on. And then have that conversation with them about what they think that they could do that week And something as little as writing it down and giving them with a piece of paper or a picture, giving them something tangible to do rather than in passing, even if you think it's so simple as like, you know, do tummy time for 20 minutes, Um, writing it down and giving something to the parents, I think goes a long way too. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, that just really resonated because I feel like so often, especially with parents, like in pediatrics and working with parents, like more often than not, the kids are the easy ones. It's the parents that we as therapists struggle more to connect with. And I like what you said, just kind of like taking a step back and realizing that this parent is not trying to be difficult. They're not trying to not do what you are asking them to do. They have so much going on and they want to do what it is that you are educating them on and what you're asking them to do but they have other barriers that are getting in the way of it actually happening. And so I think just kind of like reframing how you think about it and that it's not a difficult parent. It's a parent that is going through a difficult situation and we need to sit back and be like, how can we help them overcome this or how can we make them 
take steps in the right direction to accomplish the bigger goal and not just sit there and be like, oh, they're just trying to be difficult today. I know. Right, exactly. Or like they just, they couldn't do this one thing I asked, but you know, you never know what's going on in someone else's life. If they have multiple kids or if they're going through a marital stuff with their spouse or their workload is, is crazy. It's, it's hard. And I think if, at that moment, they can't they can't follow through. Take a step back, reflect on it, um, and just let the parents know. I think this goes a long way as a mom that I know. Letting them know that they're already doing what they need to be doing. That I think that goes a long way. When I have a parent who's like still so frustrated that Johnny can't do this or that, or that Johnny had a really hard weekend, I just say, look, you know, you guys are all working hard. Johnny's working hard in OT. You're you're exactly where you need to be. You're doing the right thing you're doing great. Like that goes a long way, especially for moms. It's that, it's that phrase that like, I never get tired of hearing, you know, someone says it like, I hope you know, you're a great mom. Like that goes a long way. And I remember before I used to say that or hear it. And I would say, well, they know that they're a great mom or like, that's just like a, a random comment. Like that's a throwaway comment. Like you don't really need to say it, but it now as a mom, it goes a long way. So I think having that connection and just saying, look, I know it's hard. You're doing everything you need to do. We just need to, you know, this is a process. I think that is like a big, big piece. Yeah. I I think a lot of times parents, they put this negative pressure on themselves, especially when the, the kids are in therapy or they've just been evaluated and they're like, I know there's something going on. And now I have the reasoning behind it. I like the therapist is telling me it's because of X, Y, and Z. And then it's almost just like this crush to their soul of like, mm-hmm. I like they've known that there's been something going on. Now they're they're validated, but they're like, Ugh, how do they kind of pick themselves up? And I know for me, like when I'm doing a lot of my evaluations and the parents like you, I give them all this education, all this information. And then it, like we're wrapping up the eval and they're like, but what else can I do? And rather than just sit there and like rattle off all of these strategies and everything that they could be doing. I always just try to take a step back and say, everything you've done so far is exactly what you needed to be doing. Like you Mm -hmm. are here, you're seeking out resources, you are doing a a fantastic job as a parent. And from now on, like our, our point is to move forward and to help you, but it's not to say, it's not to discredit everything Mm -hmm. that they've done in the past. Like Mm -hmm. they're here and they're doing their best with what they have. And I I think that's just so valuable for the parents to hear and and hear again, right? Because like they're the ones going through it. And it's just, it's so important for them to be like, okay, they they get it. They understand like, I'm not, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm not trying to be a bad parent. I'm, I'm here and I'm just doing the best that I can. Absolutely. It goes such a long way. And I don't think any mom or parent would get tired of hearing it. And it's just like you were saying at that moment, like, what else can I do? I, I, I want him to be able to be successful. I want him to be able to do this. It's like, this is a marathon. It's a slow process. Celebrate the small wins. You're doing what you need to do. Just that constant reassurance, I think goes a long way. And some parents need to hear it more often than others. But I think it's definitely something to, to keep in mind. Yeah. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about kind of what you are up to. And I want to talk about, because I know on Instagram and you also have a blog by the same name, but you go by the OT butterfly. And I am actually really curious, what is the meaning behind the name and why do you call yourself that? I'm so glad you asked me this. I was hoping you would ask me this question because I do get a lot of this question um, in the direct messages on Instagram and some of my some of my close friends are like, I love that name, but you know, what does it mean? The OT butterfly kind of has two different meanings for me. One of it is a more personal, has a more personal family tie to it, and the other one is more symbolic to OT and the the population that we serve. So my personal level, my personal tie to it with my family is my maternal grandmother. The butterfly was always her thing. Like it was her favorite. You, you ask people what their favorite animal was. Like, I know a butterfly is not an animal, but hers was a butterfly. Like in her house, every, wallpaper, like bedspreads, like she had artwork everywhere. All of her hair clips were butterflies. Like she was butterfly. And her and my grandpa had a restaurant that was called the Butterfly Cafe or and they had butterfly iced tea. Like everything was butterfly. And whenever there was 
it's only been, I think, a couple, maybe two, two deaths in the family. And we always say that, um, you know, when you see a butterfly, that it's them visiting you. There's been a couple really crazy situations where a butterfly has come like just at the right time. And it's always like, oh, it's just like so calming to me and like, oh, that's someone, you know, watching over me. So the month that I started OT Butterfly on Teachers Pay Teachers, when I was trying to think of what to call it, was a month that my grandma, who loves the butterflies, she passed away. And so I was I was toying with a bunch of different names. And then OT Butterfly just kind of came to me. I liked the way it sounded because I saw something came up on my computer, something butterfly. And I was like, oh yeah, I love butterflies. And then I was thinking my grandma that just passed, I said, that's perfect. Like that's just like the perfect sign that this is what it needs to be called. And then as I was building that on Instagram and TPT, I started to realize that butterflies themselves just are such a symbolic icon for the process of OT and that you are transforming our clients, anyone, not just a not just a pediatric client, anyone across the lifespan, giving them the skills that they need to to grow and to to be independent. And so I like to say that I am transforming my clients. I'm sending them off into the world as to, as butterflies. They're flying out and being independent. And so I think that that metamorphosis the butterfly goes through is just also really iconic for for OT. I love that. I, yeah. So, okay. I have kind of a interesting connection as well to butterflies. So a couple years ago, actually, I, I started this thing where I would always give my, my mom a plant for her birthday, for Christmas, like for mother's day, for any sort of like special day, I would go to this nursery that's by my house and I'd pick up a plant for my mom. And one time I happened to pick up this plant. I had really no idea what it was. It looked cool and it had some pretty flowers on it. And I was checking out and the guy that was like ringing me up, he's like, oh, look, you get a special bonus with this. And I was like, what, what is he talking about? And he points to the plant and there happens to be a caterpillar on it. And it's not just any caterpillar. It's actually the monarch butterfly caterpillar. And I'm just like ecstatic. I'm like, this is this is the coolest thing. I've actually never seen this before. And so I give my mom the plant, she plants it, it grows and it turns into, she gets like all these other caterpillars. And then of course with caterpillars, they go into their cocoons and they become butterflies. And it kind of became one of the things that my mom and I connect upon of watching the progression of the caterpillars into their chrysalises and then turning into the butterflies. And then I actually picked up some of the same plants and and planted them in my garden. And so I kind of developed my own affinity for watching this progression. And I learned so much that I didn't know about caterpillar to butterfly progression and transitions and realize like everyone just talks about the caterpillar it just eats and eats and eats and then it (sighs) crawls into uh the cocoon and then it turns into a butterfly but there's all these other struggles that the caterpillar goes through as you watch they have to have enough food they have to be able to get to the food they have to like not be eaten by birds and all this kind of stuff (laughs) And then like the craziest thing, at least with the caterpillars that I dealt with, they would travel a long distance and then they have to like, they, uh, it, it's like the, the craziest, like most fascinating thing, but they have to like put this little like substance to like stick themselves to, they build the chrysalis and then they turn into mush basically, ah. like for lack of a better term. And it's actually like, it's messy. Like they literally oh. dissolve themselves. It sounds weird. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can actually, with, with the type of butterfly that uh, that I'm familiar with, you can actually watch as they start to like rebuild and the wings form and the colors start to form. And then watching them come out of the cocoon and watching them drying their wings and kind of the struggles of even before they can take flight. Like it's amazing because it's not just this like seamless transition of like everything's easy. Like there's all these other struggles that they have to go through. And I think that really just kind of ties into life like life is full of struggles and life is full of change and it might not always be pretty but you're going to get where you need to be in the end and so like as you're talking I'm just like yeah I yeah I know like this is totally like my connection to butterflies as well that is 
so cool. I didn't realize that I also didn't realize all of that, all of the stuff that went into it too. I have to say that I learned, I learned most about my butterfly and caterpillar science life from like kindergartners who have, (laughs) they do like a caterpillar week. Yep. (laughs) And they always tell me like, we're going caterpillar. And now I feel like now you telling me that I really didn't know all of that. And I kind of want to see what I can do um, here at home too. I think my daughter would love seeing that. Yeah, it is so cool to watch and just to follow the the lifespan of the caterpillar into the butterfly. Like there'd be days, like every single day, I I'd walk out, I'd go check on the caterpillars, like watch <laughs> watch their size because they go from like tiny, so cool. tiny, tiny to these massive caterpillars, and then like follow where they go, and they end up in these like random locations, and then I I watch as the chrysalis change and all this kind of stuff. Like it's absolutely fascinating, and I kind of geek out over it. But you don't? Do you have to have them like in like one of those like caterpillar like cages or like a closed thing? Or I they didn't, just no. This I mean they naturally happened uh, just by buying. The plants. plants. Yeah. The plants that I had, they're called milkweeds and there's lots of different variations, but that's the specific plant that monarch butterflies will, or monarch caterpillars will eat. And yeah, like butterflies will find them and then they will lay their eggs on it. And then the caterpillars, like it's, it literally just happened naturally in my garden. That is so fascinating. I'm going to have to definitely I'm going to have to definitely do that and then document it on OT Butterfly. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That would be so cool. (laughs) Okay. So getting back to your blog and kind of your Instagram page, what was it that really inspired you to want to even do that in the first place? So I actually – so it actually kind of took a turn in a good way. But my original idea was I was starting to share – my resources on Teachers Pay Teachers for other educators and therapists because a lot of people were asking about that. I naturally just create more resources to help the parents that I work with and the teachers that I work with to help them kind of understand OT. And then also sometimes I would create worksheets and activities for my for my clients. So someone suggested I put on Teachers Pay Teachers. So I did that. And then my idea was to start Instagram to showcase that. But as I met amazing people in the OT community like you and, and Taylor and just so many other wonderful OT people out there alongside my daughter's journey as it started to come out recently, um, it also kind of shifted into being more of an outlet and a community growth that way with other OTs and then a small, small community of other OT moms like myself who are also struggling with kids with sensory needs. And I have a close kind of community that we chat about those kinds of daily struggles too. So it's kind of twofold. Some of it will show some of my resources for pediatric, like school age clients, but a lot of it is me sharing my journey with my daughter and my own like emotional struggles as a mom and like mom guilt. And am I doing this right? And just being really open about what it's like, because I think sharing the perspective of OT mom is um, is very different and I think is valuable in itself to help other practitioners um, and other moms too kind of see both sides and how it can really look. So I have to give a big shout out to Taylor from Taylor Made OT because she's the reason that I found you and then started following your page. And I absolutely love everything that you stand for and everything that you share because there is this like raw honesty that comes from what you put out there because you share your journey with your daughter and you're you're so open about it and some of your posts are I mean I'm I'm thinking about the one with uh the what was it the split screen of like oh. you and the alligator <laughs> and your daughter yes. touching it, it was something gooey Orbeez. it was, <laughs> it was Orbeez. the Orbeez. And like your facial reactions were like (laughs) spot on, like they were the exact Uh same. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, (laughs) I think you said like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree or something like that. And I was like, like, yeah, where she gets it from. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Right. Yep. And yeah, I've just, I've really enjoyed seeing everything that you've kind of been putting out into the world and the resources that you have for teachers and for parents and for other therapists to implement into their treatments. What would you say are some of your favorite resources that you have? Oh, so my most recent one that I 
was talking a lot. I did an Instagram live on, I saw you on there for a little bit. Um, <laughs> I think I was like, like in the middle of something and I'm like, I have to pop on. Oh, you know what it was? I was at the airport and I was waiting to get on a oh, plane okay. and I'm like, I can get on for like 10 minutes before I have to get on the plane. And so I did. <laughs> I know when I see someone that's like, someone's always doing a live, like I have to co- go in for a little bit, but then I feel bad when I can't stay. But <laughs> anyway, so my, I was talking about, the discrepancy or that gap between the follow through from when it goes from a classroom program or classroom sensory supports from the OT given to the teacher and how there's really a lack of resources and time, both financially and time resources that the school doesn't have to be able to give the teachers the education. Because, I mean, we're talking about educating parents about their child's needs for sensory input and sensory supports, but the teachers need to know the why behind it too, so that they can feel a little bit less intimidated or kind of understand why it's so important that those students have the supports in their classroom and that at the end of the day, it it will hopefully make their day easier in the long run if they are able to do some of these sensory strategies and supports. So I have a resource that is called the Classroom Sensory Strategies Guidebook, and it's meant for OTs to give to teachers and you can personalize it per student based on their sensory profile and what tools that they have available for the classroom so that when you give this to the teacher, the idea is this is Johnny's sensory strategies guidebook. It has his name on it. And when you open it up, it has only his sensory profile needs. If he's over responsive to visual input, uh, but under responsive to proprioceptive, those pages are printed out for him and specific strategies to do that will help him in the classroom. And it also includes just a little bit of information on what signs he might be showing in the classroom that is linked to that specific sensory domain, like visual input or proprioceptive input. So that the teacher, so that this resource can kind of be a jumping off point for a discussion. And so that it can slowly start educating the teachers on how to also think like a therapist so that they can also kind of DIY sensory strategies in the classroom without working off of just a specific prescribed sensory list. Yeah. So not only is it like jam packed with resources and information and just all sorts of good information, it is absolutely beautiful as well. I've I've seen your pictures on Instagram and I'm just like, wow, like you really put in a lot of time and a lot of effort into this resource. Oh, thank you. Yes, I do. And it's honestly, it, it takes a lot of time, but it's one of my, like, it's fun for me. I, I count it as leisure, even though it also doubles as work, but it's just relaxing and I love creating that stuff. And it only takes, like, like I said, the Instagram community has been amazing. I've received a, like a handful of comments from other moms, from a speech therapist, from an OT in Brazil who reached out to me and was like, this was so helpful for me. And if anything, it's not about the money and it's not about, you know, X amount of followers, but making those connections truly has been so valuable for me and just like humbling that like someone is listening to me in Brazil. And I'm sure you know this as a podcast, you get listeners probably internationally as well, that it's just, it's crazy that the, what social media can do connecting us as a community. And that if I could share and help one person out there with an Instagram post or an Instagram live or a resource that I know is helping them as a therapist or parent, but ultimately another student or client is benefiting from that. That's just amazing to me. Mm Mm-hmm. So much yes to that, like 100% yes, yes, yes to all of that. Uh, I I love the social media OT community and I've gained a lot from it. And so, yeah, I'm like totally just nodding my head as you're talking. I'm like, "Ah, yep, yep, (laughs) I totally get it. So if people want to find out more about you, where can they find you? So I am on Instagram as at the OT butterfly. I also have a blog that is a work in progress. It's the OT butterfly.com. I am also on teachers pay teachers. So if you go on teachers pay teachers.com slash store slash the OT butterfly, and I'll give you the link for that too, to put in the show notes. Those are the three main places that I'm at. I do have a Facebook page, but I'm admittedly not the best at keeping it updated. I feel like Instagram's been more of the shining star 
recently. So I'm always on Instagram, always happy to meet new people and chat anything OT, anything mom life. I'm there. So send me a direct message if anyone wants to connect. Perfect. And I will make sure that I link to all of these so people can easily access it in the show notes for this episode. All right. Last question. One word to describe occupational therapy. What would it be? Oh, I'm so excited for this question. I listen to all your podcasts and I think about it all the time. I'm actually surprised no one said it yet. (laughs) Because I was thinking, I'm like, oh my gosh, are they going to take it? Unless I haven't listened far back enough. But I have thought this word from the beginning when I first, when I first was in grad school and I was so upset that no one knew what OT was that I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. How does no one know how come OT is so buried? Like, why, why are we getting more funding? Why don't people understand it? And I was like, they should rename it to functional therapy. So my word for OT is functional. I think it just it describes it to a T. It's exactly what it is. We work on things that are functional in people's daily lives. What's functional for one child might not be functional for another based on their environments and you know what classroom that they're in. So I might not have to work on this skill for Johnny, but I might have to work on it for the other student because it's more functional for his daily life. And that just allows us to work on so many different things because it's just at the end of the day, it's just whatever is functional and meaningful to that person in their daily life. I think you're right. I do not think that that has been used yet. I'm like, I'm racking my brain. I'm like, I don't think I remember that being, being said I yet. <laughs> yeah. When I listen to them and I, I'm like, it's functional. And then I hear so many other great words. And I'm like, oh, I was like, oh my goodness. Functional is just the, the word that just pops out. Well, thank you, Laura. This has been just so fun and so informative. And I've loved getting the chance to chat with you today. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I was really excited to do this talk when you invited me on here. I'm honored to actually be asked to be on this show. And I look forward to hearing more from you and maybe meeting some of your listeners out in social media land. Hey, before you go, I just wanted to say thanks for listening to today's episode. If you want to further the discussion, go to our website, otforlife.com, and join our Facebook group. If you like us, here are three easy ways to let us know. One, share our podcast with a friend, colleague, or anyone interested in occupational therapy. Two, leave us a review on iTunes or anywhere this podcast is found. Three, subscribe to us so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Thanks again. We'll catch you next time, OT for Lifers. That was fun. That was really fun. I like how we first talked about hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> that Okay, so that was like totally a random tangent that I'm like, I'm so glad that you took it there. That is fantastic. Like hamburgers. Oh, and I totally meant to ask, like, is it hamburger? Is it cheeseburger? Like I should have gone oh. into like more of the details of like, what is it? What, <laughs> what oh, do you my like? God. But I always get to the point of what's your OT word? And I'm like, I'm ready with my what my <laughs> OT word is. Hold on. Uh, I'm like, uh, there's a word that I want to that I don't mm-hmm. want to use. And it's like the only one coming to oh, mind right now. OK, OK, um, totally. Am I missing another one? I'm not I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's OK. <clears throat> what is the meaning? What what does that what? Oh, my gosh. Now I can't talk. <sighs> So it actually, there's two, there's two meanings. There's a more personal meaning that goes with my family meaning. I'm sorry. I want to say that again. Yep. I'd go to this, oh my gosh, what do you call it? A uh, place you buy plants. Like what am I spacing on? <laughs> I, I want to say florist. It's not a florist. What's it called? Sometimes they, sometimes they call them nurseries at like, yeah, thank you. Is that what they're called? Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. Let's, let's try that again. <laughs>